<laughs> All right, please play, pray with me. I will sing to Abba God as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please God. I will rejoice in Abba God. Bless God, O oh my soul. Amen. Please be seated. First of all, I just wanted to say, well done, good and faithful servant to Judy, who plowed through all those names without a blink. No, it was on the lector flag, right? That Acts passage, I'm not reading that one. Um, it was wrong on the lector form. There was just a little goof up, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a word in this reading that has one vowel and 15 consonants, and I really don't know how to pronounce it. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. I think you did great, but I just like to give a shout out to anyone who gets hit with a, yeah. That's the Holy Spirit, talking about speaking in different languages. There you go. Last week, Jesus prayed for his disciples. Do you remember that, right? It's okay if you don't. I know we have short-term memories or short-term memory issues. Okay, he prayed for his disciples to have the fortitude to remain in the word of God. Being not of the world, but remaining in the world means that this fledgling community belonging to Christ needed to remember that their creation as this fledgling community was solely based and sustained on God's word proclaimed in and through Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, this one who is God. As Jesus prepares to leave his disciples, he knew that the hatred of the world toward this new community of God would try to eclipse the joy and confidence of these faithful little ones. So he prayed. He prayed that they would remain one as Jesus and God are one because they are stronger together as a group and the world loves nothing else but to conquer by division. Divide and conquer. He prayed for the sustaining of their identity, that they remember whose they are because the world would do whatever it can, whatever it can to make them forget. He prayed for them to be protected in their new creation, new eyes, new ears, new words, because the world would try to steal from their new creation, forcing them to relinquish new eyes and ears, holding their proclamation hostage, demanding they forsake their divinely gifted life, love, and liberation. So Jesus knew they needed help. That's the thrust of last week's sermon, okay? Jesus knew they needed help, and so he prayed. He prayed for God to help. This little community, barely a smoldering wick, was about to be launched into the world to fend for themselves. Jesus is leaving them, and they are going to be on their own. They would be assaulted on every side because of who they were and what they said. They, like their Christ, were to become the locus of God's revolutionary activity in the world. Their message would echo Jesus's, calling into question the kingdom of humanity, exposing the upside-down world, and proclaiming words of the divine revolution in the world for the oppressed. No easy task, no small task for a fledgling community about to lose its leader. Jesus knew that they were sitting ducks, and without God, they would not make it far because this community was not a community created out of human strength, so it could not be sustained by human strength. So this community needed something bigger and stronger, something that is of the same substance as the word that not only called this community into being, but also the entire cosmos. Jesus prayed on behalf of the community, asking for God to show up, and God did. Enter the paraclete. Please take a look at your slides. There's a missing T in the bottom word, but half of you by the end of this sermon will think I've been saying parakeet the whole entire time. 
all right? It's paraclete. That's the Greek. I'm actually transliterating the Greek straight for you. I'm not saying advocate, not saying comforter. I'm saying paraclete. Paraclete, not parakeet. This is a parakeet. This is a paraclete. Okay? People get upset with me when I use the image of a dragon to talk about a paraclete. But notice how everyone <laughs> bends a knee when that dragon turns and looks. Okay? This is not a tiny little bird that's nice and funny and running from flames. This is a massive divine substance come to earth to dwell not only among you and with you, but get this in you. It is a big, massive force. So I always use the dragon as my image because it strikes that awe, all right? Strikes awe. Do you know the difference? I'm saying paraclete, not parakeet. Okay, I'm not even saying a pair of cleats, okay? Just, we can keep going with this. I'll stop though. But I, I say to you the truth. It is profitable to you that I, I go away. For if I do not go away, the paraclete cannot come to you. But if I go, I will send them to you. And coming, that one will convict the cosmos concerning sin and concerning justice and concerning judgment. I still have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them just now. But whenever this one comes, the spirit of truth, they will guide you in every kind of truth, for they will not speak from themselves. But as much as you listen, they will bring back word to you. Okay, that's our passage, a part of the passage from John. The lectionary loops us back into John 15 after bringing us to John 17 last week. Notice that Jesus actually prays for his disciples before the crucifixion. Okay, but what the lectionary is doing is drops us into Jesus' prayer and then brings us back to John 15 today. Thus, according to the logic of the lectionary, Jesus' promise of the Spirit is the fulfillment of the prayer to God to protect, guide, and strengthen the disciples who will be left in the world without Jesus. Do you see that? The lectionary is proposing an answer to the prayer, <clears throat> the paraclete. So the advent of the Spirit, the paraclete, is more than just a helper for those who will be left by Jesus. The paraclete, they are the very foundation of the church. As we say in our creed every Sunday, the Spirit is the life-giving breath of the church. For it is through, with, and by the Spirit that the work and word of Christ started in the body of Jesus will transition to the work and word of the fledgling community, who is now transfigured into the body of Christ in the world in Christ's absence. Notice what I'm doing with those words there. Transfiguration, you should think immediately, Jesus transfigured on the mountain. But here, in this moment of the Spirit descending into and among and with the people, this fledgling community, they are being transfigured, transfigured into the body of Christ in the world, even as Jesus ascends to the right hand of God. Does that make sense? Okay. It is by the Spirit of God that the paraclete, the paraclete, that God's will and mission in the world will continue to be made known to the beloved in and through the new community of God from one era to the next to the next. Okay? It is why no matter what happens to the visible church, the invisible church will proceed because of the power of the Spirit. Jesus, the reconciler, must leave the disciples and return to God, the creator, so that the Spirit of God, the Redeemer, can be sent into the world, specifically into the hearts of the disciples, to continue the work of God in the world. It's as if the Spirit, the paraclete, is now picking up the mantle that Jesus is laying down to return to God, the creator, who created the mantle in the first place. Okay? Now, I know I normally assign morning prayer to Trinity Sunday, but by no means am I off the hook. Pentecost is a Trinitarian affair, okay? In this way, God's self-revelation and mission in the world is not cut short by Jesus' bodily absence. Through the Spirit, rather than the incarnate Word, Jesus the Christ 
does the word and mission of God begin to transcend not only geographical boundaries, Acts 10 fulfilling Acts 1-8, but will also transcend chronological boundaries. If the word and mission of God is restricted to Jesus' person, what happens when Jesus, is get, when Jesus gets to a ripe old age and passes away? What happens to the mission and word of God? It stops, right? So when the Spirit comes and Jesus is brought, the Spirit, timeless being, bodiless being of God, can now move, all right? Let's think of God as the three states of water, okay? We have God the solid, God the liquid, God the gas, all right? What's going to be able to penetrate the smallest of crevices easier? If we lock this room down, what would be the best substance to try to get into this room? Gas, right? Because it can do what? Slip right in. Water's gonna maybe seep in, but it's gonna take a while because it kind of becomes a full substance and ice is going nowhere, right? <laughs> it's gonna have to melt and then evaporate, right? But think of this, and it's a bad image, and don't bring this out into the street and say, we believe in God the water, okay? <laughs> All right, but the spirit can actually penetrate through calcified material, rendering it alive once again, living, breathing. The spirit can move through boundaries without passports, right? And so the spirit comes, and we have this moment. Remember in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, I will, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, be in Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. It is through the spirit that that happens, okay? By the sending of the spirit, the word of God will continue in the world. The light of truth will continue to illuminate hearts and minds from one era to another, in one context to a completely different one, through decades, centuries, and millennia. Do you ever wonder why the disciples, when the spirit comes upon them, they start speaking in different languages? Well, yes, we do have a, we, we have a, we have a restatement of the Tower of Babel. Yan Yu is back here. Do you, hey, He's, say it loud, say it proud. <laughs> yes, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a multiculturalness that is being already predetermined in the movement of the spirit. It is not going, when the spirit moves into different geographies, Okay, different cultures, it's going to speak the language of that culture. Not everyone is going to speak one language. Does that make sense? Meaning the spirit's going to go in and take on the flavors of the area and terrains that it goes into to bring God's truth up into it in a way that they understand. Meaning there's no one way to do Christianity. It's going to look different from era to era, from country to country, from nation to nation, from people to people, from person to person. Does that make sense? Okay. It is through the witness of the Spirit in the lives of the disciples that witnesses back to Christ and thus forward to God. You see how I'm saying that Pentecost is a Trinitarian affair? The Spirit's going to bring people into Christ, which is then going to point forward to God and God's action in the now and in the future, leading us, calling us forward, all right? And this is the continual fuel for the fire of divine revolution, setting human hearts ablaze like matchsticks, one by one. And the spirit is neat because it can be in Scott, and it can be in Linda, and it can be in me, all right? And it's the same spirit, but three different people, right? It doesn't have to take on it. We don't all look alike. We don't all act alike, right? It is for this reason that Jesus both addresses the disciples' impending grief, being left alone in the world. They have legitimate distress, okay? And exhorts them towards joy. Even though they will grieve Jesus' absence, feel fear and anxiety, they will be comforted by God's presence, the paraclete, who will usher them further into God's truth and into God's reality, thus farther and deeper into God and God's self. This is why Jesus turns the conversation toward what the paraclete will do when they show up, because it's through the disciples and through the church that will be born through their bodies 
and the word of God, that the paraclete will expose the world's misconceptions of what sin is, what justice is, and what judgment is. And we were just talking about that last bit in the Lord's Prayer class, how our judgment is skewed wrongly. We tend to, val we tend to say bad is good and good is bad, right? We tend to flip everything. So the paraclete's going to expose all this. In this way, and to quote, quote um, 20th century uh, German theologian Rudolf Bultmann, the world is accused and the paraclete is the prosecutor. With the paraclete set loose in the world through the disciples, human sin is exposed by divine righteousness. Human justice is brought to trial by divine justice. And human judgment is found guilty by divine judgment. And all I have to do is recall for you Good Friday to Easter. Human judgment put Jesus on the cross and released whom? Barabbas. That's a skewed understanding of judgment, right? What was God's response? Like for like? Absolutely not. What did God do on Easter morning? Raise Jesus. Love one. Okay? The one word of God is always new in every moment as a word of revelation. It is not static doctrine, archaic dogma, suffocating fundamentalism, or legal, deadly legalism. Rather, it is always a new living word summoning the dead in their tombs into life in the world. God's truth continues to be this light of truth in the world, exposing human sin, human judgment, and human justice for what it is made of dust and to dust it shall return. Thus, Jesus can assure the disciples that even though he has much more to teach them, he will leave that to the paraclete who will guide them, teach them, lead them into every kind of truth, further revealing Christ into the world, further instigating God's divine revolution of life, love, and liberation in the world in pursuit of God's beloved. The paraclete will not lead the disciples, those then and those now, to a static conception of God or into a conception of God so different. There must be a break with this history set out through Christ. Okay? In other words, that was a poorly worded sentence. You're not, with the paraclete, you're not going to get a static once for, once for all image of God. Okay? With the paraclete, according to to culture, according to nation, according to person, you're going to get a representation, an, an, an invitation into God that is going to be for that time and space and place. And, but it's going to be truthful to the witness of God made known to us in Christ. Okay? It's not going to break from that history, but it's going to bring it into the modern era. Therefore, the church is going to look different in the 1500s, in the 1800s, in the 1900s, in the 2000s. Okay? And that also means that no human being can claim exactly what God can and cannot do in a given era, in a given culture, in a given nation. That's a better way of saying that. I messed up that other sentence. In other words, divine truth will be revealed in every moment as the present moment, whatever, wherever it is. God's truth, divine truth, will be revealed by the divine word and ushered into divine comfort by the paraclete, who is the spirit of truth starting first with the community, whatever or wherever they are, and billowing outward into the world. The revelation of God starts with the word. The word should be here, but the word shouldn't stay here. It should then transcend these doors, right, and go out into the world, revealing what divine justice looks like, revealing what the right conception of sin is, revealing what good divine judgment is, okay? So those first disciples lost their mane. Okay, like four of you know what I mean by that. Okay. <laughs> the, the main character you might pick on a, on a gaming system. Okay, like your go-to person. I play, um, I love Mario Kart, and I always go to Yoshi. Okay, Yoshi's my main. I'm always going to turn to Yoshi in a time of heated battle on Mario Kart, right? Jesus was their main. 
all right? They lost Jesus whom they loved dearly. They staked their lives on this love of Christ, and then he left them. The distress they felt was real. It's a distress that we feel today, feeling left and abandoned by God without Jesus to be here with us bodily. But the paraclete never left the world once the paraclete came into it. The paraclete remains in the world and always with the disciples of Christ, those who are, the, who are thrust by faith into God and are dependent on God's word. Our God is triune, three persons, one God, personal and close at all times, in all eras. God is not dead, dear ones. God is alive. God is here. God is with us. God is within us. Martin Luther writes about this portion of the Gospel of John. Therefore, God has been gracious to us and has given us a comforter to counteract the spirit of terror, a comforter who, as God himself, is much stronger with his comfort than the devil is with his terror. The one who lives in us and through us is the one who can bend space and time to become one spot and moment so that all time and all space is in this God of presence, revelation, and comfort. Yet comfort only comes when God's truth exposes and reveals us. The way we miss the mark, our decrepit ideas, our broken systems, and our violent ideologies. By the presence of the Spirit, its conviction, we cannot pretend not to see what we see, hear what we hear, feel what we feel. We do not have the luxury of undoing God summoning us out of our tombs back at Easter. By the Spirit, the paraclete, this humble community bends its knees, confesses, and finds absolution by faith in Christ and union with God. Through the conviction and exposure of the paraclete, divine comfort becomes true comfort, not the comfort of the world that is fleeting, comfort that lasts through thick and thin because it's built out of the stuff of the infinite and not the finite, out of the eternal and not the terminal, out of the substance of God and not the substance of humanity. God's spirit of truth, the paraclete, the prosecutor comes to bring God close to us through the light of truth to live with us and among us and in us, to work in and through us the divine revolution of God's love, life, and liberation in the world. Today we rejoice because Christ's joy is made complete in us through the sending of the paraclete who binds us to God through Christ. We can let go of the rope and fall into God because God will show up, because God never left us. Pentecost isn't just another Sunday in the life of the church. It is very much the life-giving breath of the church. Today, yesterday, and tomorrow. 